Pastor John C. Enelama is an apostle, leadership expert, author, and renowned conference speaker. The primary thrust of his ministry is to spread the fire of revival and reformation among the nations of the earth. His passion to raise agents of change in society led him to co-establish apostles in the marketplace a network committed to advancing leadership principles in the marketplace and building a platform for change agents in society. Pastor John is also the senior pastor of World Revival Church and president and founder of End Time Revival Ministries, both situated in Lagos, Nigeria. He is a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. As a crusader, Pastor John has carried the message of reformation around the world with outreaches to several countries, including Trinidad and Tobago, South Africa, the Netherlands, Zambia, Malawi, and the United States of America. He is also initiated and led the Aquesta Village Project, which has been actively involved in rehabilitating and feeding the street youth. Pastor John hopes to achieve his vision by preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and shaping the thinking of a new generation while building and preserving eternal truths in the heart of men. Ladies and gentlemen of this present house, please let us rise tonight and welcome Pastor John C. Enelama. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this very rainy day. I hope you can hear me out there. Okay. Well, this is our relationship when it's day, and um, I'm glad we're all able to come out. I pray that God will speak to us in Jesus' mighty name. Well, maybe one more time, just say hello to somebody close to you, to your left, to your right. Just say hello to somebody. Praise God. Um, we have a few minutes, and then I, I believe we have a Q&A session from the instruction from Pastor G. So what I would like to do is to lay some background, and then we can go from there. The subject, the, the subject we are considering this evening, in fact, the way it was given to me was um, the reverse, was marriage, courtship, and singles. Am I, is that all right? Yeah? So I, I kind of reversed it to singles, courtship, and marriage, you know? And you understand why? Because one leads to the other. We don't want to go from marriage to single. <laughs> eh? Exactly. So, um, but let, let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening. We are humbled to be in your eternal presence. Thank you for the time of worship. Thank you for the leadership of this house, for all the men and women that labor. Thank you for the apostle over the house. We thank you for this evening. We commit ourselves into your hands. We pray that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will instruct us, you will teach us. Let the will of God be paramount in our lives tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. What we can see, show us. What we don't know, teach us. What we don't understand, help us to comprehend it. We pray that when we live here, that our life would have been much better for it. Thank you, Father, because we know you have heard. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let's, let me start from current affairs. Like some of our, you know, we're, I'm sure we are talking in the room before we came. So let's, let's look at Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Just briefly, um, just to connect with the times in which we live very briefly and then set a contest. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Ecclesiastes, the preacher. Chapter 3 from verse number 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. In verse 17, I said in my heart, 
God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. So this scripture puts us in context. It says there's a time. It says in the beginning, it says everything there is a season and then a time for every purpose under heaven. So if we were to interpret this verse, we would just say in our common language today that our lives are lived in seasons and there is a time for everything we have to do and we need to do. And in that way, we all understand it, that there are seasons, we're in the rainy season, so it's not unusual that there is rain. We understand that. But this is also significant because we then have to ask ourselves, what time is it for Nigeria? What time is it for Nigeria? And then you can go a little further, even before we start to answer, what time is it for this present house? What time is it in God's destiny for this local church? What time is it at this time? What season are you in? And then you go a little further, you, you, you come to the individual, to those of us who are gathered here tonight and say, what time is it in your life? Where exactly are you in your life? Now, why is the concept of time so relevant as we'll talk about some of the things we're going to be talking about this evening? Well, when a man does not know time, it can put you under pressure. For example... If people are getting married around you and you are single and it's not time for you to marry, maybe because Mrs. Wright or Miss Wright and Mr. Wright, maybe they're not ready. But you think you're ready, but your partner is not ready. Since the plane cannot fly without the co-pilot. So even, no matter how prepared you are, if you think about it from God's perspective, if your potential partner is not ready, God has to get them ready. So imagine that you're all worried. You get under pressure. You know, it's like, what's going on? So not knowing time can put you under tremendous pressure. But if you knew time and you knew your season, the season of your life, if it's a time, I mean, one of the examples I use all the time is the example of those of us who came from the generation where we took jam, you know. You know, there were people that took jam and because of all these cut-up marks, they didn't make, make the cut-up mark. And some people stayed at home for a year or stayed at home for a year. But what is interesting to me today is that I look back 30 plus years. I finished secondary school in 1985. I look back 31 years and I think about people who didn't make jump in 1985 and they are consultants today. They are medical doctors all over the world. They don't even remember. They just said, I'm going to read medicine, so I'm, I'm not taking any other course. And they took jam the next year and then they went to medical school and the rest is history. So can you imagine if somebody gave up for missing four marks, for not getting caught up and, and you refuse to become a medical doctor? But look at the passage of time. It doesn't matter anymore. So, but, but again, we have to understand that, that what, what makes time so relevant also is the fact that, that the heavens and the earth have laws that govern them. The heavens and the earth, the Bible tells us in Job, that God put laws in the heavens and in the earth. And we, we call them the laws of the universe or, or the laws of creation. The laws of the heavens, we understand it because of the sun, the moon, and all the things that happen there. Well, and there are laws that govern the earth. There's the law of vision, for example, that what a man sees is what he gets. What about the law of action, that nothing happens until you make it happen? There are laws of, there are, there are, there are, there are laws, law, the law of faith, that with God all things are possible. Be it unto you according to your faith. The law of faith, that in this life, what, eventually what happens to a man depends on the man. That go, though God create rules in the affairs of men, that we, have, we are co-architects with God in the execution, if not in the creation, at least in the execution of our destiny. That God determines my potential, but I determine my reality. All the things I'm capable of are in God, but what I become, I have a part to play. I had an influence over my scores in Waiek. I could have had better scores. I met somebody a few months ago, and she's, she, she's studying at Harvard. She's born here, went to school here, and maybe did A-levels in the UK, and she said when I was in primary five, my parents took me to lessons in Lakey. I did lessons all of primary five, all of primary six, and I passed to Loyola. When she said that, it just dawned on me that with a different set of parents who didn't do lessons, she wouldn't, be, she wouldn't have gone to Loyola. Same intellect. The reason she passed was that they spent quality time preparing her for lessons. You know, and it dawned on me again that, that the, the, how you're born, who you're born to can influence your destiny. That heaven releases potential, what you're capable of being. But let's come back to the concept of time. What makes time so different is that time is a controlling law. All other laws on earth are subject to the law of time. 
Time is a controlling law. And, and again, the concept of time we have to understand is that God created time to create life. God lives outside of time. So time is an earthly phenomenon. Time is something, is of this earth. Outside of this earth, in God's realm, which we call eternity or the eternal dimension, there's no time. He has no beginning, no end. We don't know how God started. God has no end. So with God, there's no time. A thousand years, like one day. One day, like a thousand years. He lives outside of time. So time is an earthly phenomenon. God created time to create life on earth. But then, because we are all put in time, all of our lives are subject to time. All. Your time indeed is your life. Your time indeed is your life. If your time expires, your life is up. So, what you do with time is what you've done with your life. And then, but in this passage, he said, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. The time to refrain from embracing is when a man is single, or when a, when a woman or a man is single. He talks about seasons, and then he said, a time to embrace. So, when we come to the subject of marriage, I, I consider it very interesting because tonight I would like us to look at it first from a divine perspective. And then from a human perspective. You know, the ways of God are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher. But a man can approach God as you take time to know him. What does God think about marriage? What is the origin of marriage? A few months ago, well, not months, weeks, maybe less than two months ago, I was, my wife and I were taking a marriage class at Harvard. You know, we just launched the class. We do it here and we decided to take it there among the students. You know, and I asked the question, so, who is the author of marriage? Most people agreed, okay, God, yes. And then, what is the oldest corporation in America? Because people didn't know, and I said, well, Harvard is. Harvard was founded in 1634, incorporated in 1636. Harvard University is the oldest corporation in America. And I said, how old is marriage older than Harvard? So marriage is the oldest institution on earth. Marriage is the oldest institution on earth. And what makes the subject of marriage interesting is that marriage was originally and is God's idea. It was not man's idea. It was not man that decided to marry. It was God that decided man should marry. So the first challenge you face is that when you enter a divine institution with human logic, you will fail. You are bound to fail. Marriage is not cultural. It's God's idea. The culture might impact it, but it's not about culture. The, uh, the principles transcend culture. The principle of two becoming one. So let's look at the Bible. Let's take some basic fundamental scriptures. Genesis chapter 2. Scriptures that we're familiar with in verse 18. And the Lord God said... It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Genesis 2, 18. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll come back to that passage to, and try to interpret it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I read from verse 1. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. What makes it good for a man not to touch a woman? What's Paul writing about? He said, concerning things you wrote about, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Look at verse 2. Then he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let's reason with Paul the Apostle and think about what he's saying here. He's saying, if you are single, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Just stay your way. I stay my way. But to avoid sexual immorality, it's better for a man to take a wife and say, this is my wife, and for a woman to say, this is my husband. Why does Paul write that? First, because he understands that there is a God-given desire in every man from creation to love and be loved. It's normal, natural, placed in man by God. But then, but God has laws. When we talk about singleness, singlehood, being single, the challenge we face today is that we live in a modern society and where we might, we might not always understand where God is coming from. 
You know, the Bible says that Joseph was betrothed or espoused to Mary and that they had never come together. And then Joseph came to Mary and then Mary said, I want to share something extremely important with you. He said, what? He said, I'm pregnant. You're pregnant. How? How come? He said, the story is not over. This pregnancy is of God. <laughs> he said, well, look, I don't understand what you're saying, but I ought to report you to the elder. So they stone you to death, but I'm going to leave you to be by yourself. But don't even tell me that kind of story anymore. I'll quietly walk away from this relationship. I don't understand what has happened. Why was it such a big deal? Why, why did Joseph talk about the stoning of Mary? Why, why was, this was their culture, their custom. In their time, a woman married as a virgin. She, the parents have to produce the proof of her virginity if the husband brought a case against her. We know that from the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? So, different world, different culture, at a different time in history. But why would God have such strict rules? Well, those times also had fewer divorce rates. Because people, the way they married, is that they married for different reasons. One of the reasons was they married because of background. They married because of politics, fame, money, families, married families. It wasn't so much as how beautiful you are. Because you really didn't have time to even investigate the beauty. You didn't even see each other to know how beautiful they were, really. It was a different time in history. But the marriages survived. The laws that God put in place, as a cake as it sounds, the marriages survived because those laws, as funny as they sounded, as strict as they were, they created a different society. Now, over time, the biggest challenge people face when it comes to marriage is when it's time to marry, how do you know, who to, how do you know whom to marry? How do you find a spouse? So man's solution to the divine challenge of finding who to marry is try your luck. And that try your luck has progressed over time and, is, and today it's called the dating game. Okay? And dating is a modern invention. Now, I know we have internet, so you can, everything I say you can research. You know, I'm, I'm not going to put anything that I manufactured. Dating is an invention of the 20th century. In colonial America, people didn't even date. Dating was as a direct result of urbanization. Before the world urbanized, people actually went to people's homes to check them out. You sat in front of parents, you conversed, you were supervised. This was not about Christianity, just the way the world was. They were not all Christians. You don't, you don't, you don't, you didn't see, you didn't have opportunity to see a woman on the street. No woman was on the street anywhere in the world. I mean, it just didn't exist. But as the world urbanized, it happened that people didn't have enough rooms at home, so people started what they called the calling game. You called people, you met in cinema, and then you started relationship. You called it going steady from there to dating, and so on and so forth. But we're still trying to solve a problem. The problem is that whom do I marry? So let's understand that that's what we're trying to solve. In other words, how can I find whom to marry? So you try this, you try that, you go out with somebody. But the challenge with that is that when people went out, when they had challenges, which is bound to occur in human relationship, what did they do? They went their separate ways. And then what did you do? You found somebody else. If you are the man, the hunter, you hunted somebody else. Okay, if you are the woman, the hunted, or the hunter yourself, you found somebody. But it, the, the next challenge with that, of course, was that, that eventually people change spouses the way they change dating mates. So marriage started to go down. But the problem we're trying to solve is the problem of if I want to marry, if the desire to marry is in me and I'm old enough to marry, how can I know whom to marry? How do I even know how to marry and when to marry? So I define dating as a human solution to a divine problem. Okay? Now, there's no real definition. But the Bible then talks about courtship by implication. And I'll tell, I'm going to make some comparison before we go into marriage. But before we even do that, let me state it here for starters that everybody does not need to marry. But if you choose to marry, 
if your marriage is going to go the distance, you have to do it the right way. In other words, you are not incomplete because you're not married. Marriage brings completeness. There's no doubt about that. And we're going to discuss that. But being single is a blessing. And there are things that single people ought to do. If single people live the way they ought to live, you will have even better marriages. So what should a person do when you're single? The Bible says, love your neighbor as you do what? Love yourself. One of the things you do as a single person, learn to love yourself so you can love your future spouse. Take yourself out. Get to know yourself. Love yourself. Know your strength, your weakness. Discover your calling. Why did God make me? You can discover it in marriage, but what difference it makes if a person knew what they had been sent into the world to do? If a person has discovered destiny, you've taken time to prepare yourself. What should you do when you're single? Prepare yourself. How should you prepare yourself? Be the kind of spouse you would like to marry yourself. Be the kind of person you would like to marry. So, the standards you set for a future spouse, become that standard. Take time. One of the major reasons for failure in marriage is lack of preparation. People use words like compatibility. They say the marriage is not making it, they're not compatible. God doesn't think in compatibility. He doesn't believe in that. Marriages that work do not work because the partners are compatible. It works because the partners work extremely hard on themselves, not even on the marriage. Compatibility means to like your spouse. When, when people like each other, they see they're compatible. Likeness and love are not the same. The best marriages are marriages where people were friends and they got married. Friendship. What I mean by friends is that I like you. I, I don't know. I just like the way you behave and that. But when you start with love, and which you can't distinguish from infatuation and confusion, it becomes complex. But so when you say compatible, it's like, I like my partner. We're compatible. Why? I like her. But the point is that it's not like saying, you say, they're not compatible. They don't like the same food. That's not the basis of marriage. Marriage is hard work. When you see couples smiling, if they're genuinely smiling, somebody is working hard or both are working extremely hard. Everybody is carrying some baggage. Have, do you, do you, have you wondered how you feel when you're not happy? Imagine somebody living with you when you're not happy, you're grumpy, you wake up, you don't want to talk to anybody, and you're married. And your wife says, good money. You say, good money to you. What, what's the problem again? I beg. Those things happen in all marriages. But the truth is that marriage... It's hard work. But the hard work starts when you're single. To work hard on yourself. The hardest work on earth is working on yourself. It's deciding. It's deciding that I'm going to work hard on myself. Before we even jump further, just remember that the marriages that people that work and make it are marriages that the partners see their marriage as a project that cannot fail. In other words, a man goes out of his way to say, I'm going to make my spouse happy at my own cost. I just find out what makes my wife or my husband happy, I'll do it. But, but, and, and, and it's give and take, but it's not, it's not a place where you count, I've done so much, you have done so little. When you talk like that and think like that, you're going to fail. You, you can't say, look, I've given so much of my, you have given so little. It doesn't work. It's hard work, it's sacrifice. But let's go back to being single. Because for those of us tonight who, who are single and desire to marry, just remember this. You have to enjoy being single and enjoy your single life because, because if you marry well, you'll never be single again. Because many single people want to marry and many married people want to be single. So you have to avoid that. You have to, you have to avoid, and the only way to avoid that is to enjoy the seasons of your life. Live out your seasons. Being single is a blessing. Being single is being single-eyed. It's taking time to prepare for life. It's, it, don't spend all your single life thinking about who you're going to marry. You, eventually you'll marry and you start clocking five years, ten years, fifteen years. And don't let the level deceive you about sex. You know, about this thing called sex and intimacy that is such a big deal. And they are thinking, you know, that when am I going to... And people are saying, look, if you are, if you're going, let's check each other out. Yeah, when you marry, you're going to have more than enough time in a normal situation. So just relax and calm down and don't be deceived. Someone has said to me that every time you see a couple in a car and they are not talking to each other, they are husband and wife, if they are laughing, they are girlfriend or boyfriend, no commitments, no responsibility. You know, so it sounds funny, but, but, but again, it comes back. The only, the lack of preparation is not the only reason people have problems, but it's one of the major reasons. The statistics of marriage lets us know that first marriages fell about 50% on the average in America. Second marriage is about 60%. 
thought marriage is 70 percent marriages don't get better because people remarry when people remarry they are carrying extra baggage it's worse because first of all you have memories you have hearts you have issues you have children so it's not easier it's not so don't think i'm going to try do my first attempt second attempt no it doesn't work that way so let's 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 summarize being single that it's a blessing to be single settle it in your heart enjoy it one of the things i've said and i say all the time is that when you're single love yourself practice self-love take yourself out and eat just relax just one life to live enjoy it ask yourself what makes me angry what makes me happy what are my strengths what are my weaknesses what has god called me to do answer those basic and fundamental questions who am I? What's, what, what destiny has God pre-prepared for me? We are his workmanship, created for good works, which God has preordained. None of us is an accident of nature. You are created on purpose. You will never have entered the earth space except you have a purpose and a destiny. These are fundamental things that rule our lives. It's not so much about how your net worth, how, much, how rich you become. Remember that all these things have their place. There's so much more to life than materialism. There's so much more so much more you have to go beyond that you have to know what is a tool and what the real deal is there are things that god gives us abilities strengths in order to live life on earth but don't confuse that with the life itself don't confuse that you have to understand that god has a purpose for every life god has a purpose the person you eventually marry is in god's thinking is an integral part of his purpose for your life it's not a casual decision now, of course, you can look at it and say, is there only one person reserved for me to marry? Well, those are things that are left in the prerogative of God to answer. I don't need to give my brain too much headache. But the important thing is that don't marry casually. Because it's for a lifetime in the, the Christian way. Now, can people divorce? The answer is yes. It depends on the condition. But it's, it's something, it's a subject that is so complex. It's not something that the average preacher wants to get involved with. What God has joined together, let no man put us on. What about if you say, I'm the chief justice of Nigeria, I commanded the breakdown. Well, I pity you on the day of judgment. When time is no more, when you stand before God, how do you stand before God? So I tell lawyers, man, be careful. Don't use Nigerian law because the president will disappear completely. Nobody's going to defend you on that day. Be extremely careful because you're dealing with God here, remember. So as humans, we can make all kinds of assumptions, but be careful. And don't, think, don't, don't go the American way of, you know, redefinition of marriage. The Bible says that in the beginning, he made them male and female. Understand that God does not change. Those fundamentals cannot shift from God's realm. All the shiftings happens on the side of man with severe consequences. Not just the disease, not just the, the depravity, the fact that the country is going down. Look at, the American, look at America as a nation. Look at the kind of issues they have. Look at the, kind of, look at the gun issues, shooting in schools. All those kind of things. Those are choices they made 50 years ago. They are reaping them. And they're going to reap more in the years to come. Am I a prophet of them? No. You can't violate God's laws without severe consequences. There are issues about life. There are laws. You know, when you say no prayer in school, it sounds like a very casual decision. When you take away prayer, you know, people complain about the Nigerian church. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. Have you ever wondered what Nigeria would look like without the church? Just take the church out of Nigeria. Can you imagine this country? So that should keep you, give you hope that you're part of the people that are keeping Nigeria together. Take away prayer from this country. Take away godliness, righteousness. Just even if you are struggling in your righteousness, just, just, just take that struggle away. What kind of a country will we not have? So let's be careful. Being single is a blessing. And then let's, let's progress a, a bit and then talk about courtship for a moment. So what do we mean by courtship? And I started comparing dating and courtship. Let me say something, that dating, you can define it in many ways, but what makes it a challenge is that finding whom to marry is one of the hardest decisions you can make in life. The reason is that, you know, if you buy a shirt, you can change it. You know, whether it's Thomas Pink, any kind of shirt, you can, well, just go to shop, but you don't like it. You can go back and argue your way. If they don't like it, you buy another one. But marriage is not quite like that. Even if you decide to do it over and over again, it has consequences. The Bible uses the word expoused or betrothed. 
In its primary meaning, it means engagement. In the New Testament, espouse means to give a present as a token of engagement. It means that two people are engaged. In courtship, what the best way to describe it is that if you were a Christian, coming from Christian values, and you started to work with somebody, you met somebody, however, depending on the, the church and the configuration and so on and so forth, the objective is marriage. A relationship about marriage. The moment you're not getting married, you don't have a relationship. It's not like we're just friends and this friendship can last for five years. What's the plan? No plan. We're just, we're just friends. God doesn't trust you enough for that kind of friendship. You know, I shared a story. I met a friend who was a member of the church and I pastored him and he went abroad, did a master, then came back. And then I saw him suddenly somewhere. You know, he said, oh, Pastor John, how are you? I have this shop, I have that shop. Meet my friend and show me his friend. And I said, nice guy, nice girl. I said, so how long have you known that? Seven years. Seven years. What have you been doing for seven years? Friends. So I, in my mind, I started thinking, I wonder what this girl tells her parents at home and her friends. For people think maybe she even, not just in the marriage, maybe has children. And this guy is, in quotes, is my friend. But let's just say he's goofing around. You know, just... It doesn't, it doesn't sound normal because what's the objective? If you had a sister, would you attach your sister to a man for seven years? No agenda. No wedding card, no reception, no baby, no naming ceremony, no babies, nothing. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And then if you know human nature, it's difficult to be that friendly and not be sleeping together. Why? Nobody is that strong. Nobody is, if you knew yourself, you'd be afraid of yourself. People say, why don't you trust me? I don't trust you because I don't trust me. Does it make sense? Yes. Listen, we are not strong in ourselves. This is something that is so natural. It's like giving, leaving my, my brother and friend here with food on the table and say, you can't eat it. And then the guest will say, can't eat it. How can you not eat it? I mean, damn the consequences. Eat the food. They beat you up, but the food is in you. The thing is that the way we are created... We are created to love and be loved. Intimacy is natural for man. Those, the, is, the, the way it's been presented, there's nothing wrong with sexuality, intimacy. It's just the contest. God's contest is responsibility. Don't, be, don't, get that, don't get intimately involved with another person without responsibility because you'll get pregnant. And if you do, the person is likely going to check out. And if they check out, you are a single mother with a child. Society would decay if you have that multiplied. Americans, they make single motherhood to be so beautiful, but they are failing. It's a joke. Every child needs a mother and a father. Every child. I have my children living abroad. I'm telling you that a child is designed to grow up with father and mother every day. My presence at home, I don't need to talk. I just show up. My teenage son is goofing around with my wife, I just show up. I don't talk. He just sits up. It's the nature of a father. You don't need to talk. I mean, you have dignity. You have honor. You have authority. You are even tall. I mean, you just show up. He just shuts up. Every child needs that. Every girl needs a father's love before a husband's love. To put them, you need your father to love you and prepare you for love. That You don't go to University of Lagos looking for love. You know you are loved. You know you are protected. Does that make sense? That's what God designed. These are divine designs. Look, when our lives are not complete, we can tell where there are deficiencies. These are roles assigned to us by God. Marriage is a wonderful thing for those people that are meant to marry who choose to marry. If you choose to marry, it's a beautiful thing. But you have to prepare for it. You have to take time to prepare. Every church, you have a marriage preparatory class for those who are not married. The reason is that we live in an age where just imagine becoming a doctor without training. And just say that, I feel inspired to be a doctor. I feel called to be a doctor. I feel anointed to be a doctor. I feel equipped to be a doctor. I feel mentally enabled to be a doctor. And therefore, I practice medicine. What are you going to have? Quacks. Think about it for a moment. Medical school is six long years. Houseman in Nigerian system. Housemanship, youth service. Then you're still just a general practitioner. You're, you have no specialty. You're, in fact, some people, you're not even a doctor yet. Then you now, still, now start looking for specialization. You go to school and you keep educating yourself. That's why doctors are smart. It's a lot of learning. What about legal practice? Becoming a lawyer by inspiration. 
writing laws by inspiration. You can't marry by inspiration. You have to marry by knowledge. There are things. When the Bible says that he made them male and female, that's a university right there. The way a woman understands and the way a man understands, they're not the same. People fight at home because as a man, I'm trying to compel my wife to reason with me. Your wife is not meant to reason with you, believe me. Think about it. He's not, she's not logical. Let, let me explain. She's perceptive. She's, she's not going to give you seven reasons for going on vacation. We just need to go on vacation. Why? I just feel we should go. <laughs> you are saying, why should we go? He said, we should just go. I are thinking, these are the reasons why we cannot go. The economy is bad. The dollar is bad. He said, well, we need to rest our body. We need to travel. The point I'm making is that men can give logical reasons and they do it all the time. A woman is intelligent. She might be logical. I'm not saying she's not logical, but she doesn't speak, she doesn't give logical reasons all the time why something is so. Let me give you an example so we don't laugh over it. The average man, if you have the average person, no matter how much, how worldly they were before they were married, and a woman is hanging around them and maybe with a motive, in quotes, that doesn't mean she's a bad person. It doesn't mean that the man will know immediately. But your wife, whether you call it jealousy, whatever you call it, there is no love without jealousy. Love without jealousy is not real. Because God is a jealous God because he loved Israel. So let's not be confused about jealousy and love. She can pick up things and say, this is not right, this is not right. And you're thinking, why? The reason is that he made them male and female. We're different. You cannot make your spouse reason exactly like you. Communication is learned in marriage. When you say you're speaking to your wife on the average, you're listening and she's talking. I know that there are people that talk more, but the point I'm making is that to make a woman feel loved, just listen to her. I, I've shared this before. I said, when I first got married and my wife would come, come home, tell me stories about work and what happened, and I'll try to analyze it and say, but you shouldn't have done this. He said, look, the problem now is you. You're my headache here. <laughs> it took me five years to understand that she just wanted me to agree with her that she's never wrong. <laughs> the boss is wrong. The office is wrong. She's right. But when I started telling her, why did you do this? She said, look, 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 you're giving me a headache, headache. <laughs> Even when we are preparing to marry, you know, I was asking all kinds of questions. She said, look, I have a headache. Just take me home. Just take me home. I didn't understand. I tell the story of my, my younger brother. I grew up in a large family where, you know, you have to be aggressive to survive. Even for food, you know, you eat. Some people are going to the kitchen, they are eating. The food never gets to the dining table, so you have to. <laughs> so, you just survive. But so, I mean, in, if you grew up with that survival instinct, you are just, even the way you talk, you shout. It, nobody talks normally, you know. It's like, hey, Eze, come here. That's how we talked. My, my younger brother said when he got married, the wife just said, look, when you talk, you're giving me a headache. So I just noticed that my youngest brother was just now speaking in whispers all the time. <laughs> now, I know he's a redeemed pastor, so I felt maybe he's like the geo star. <laughs> but he just said, look, my wife said I was giving her a headache, so I had to change the way I spoke. <laughs> and years have passed. He's remained like that. He had to change to survive. Because the wife said, look, look, we're not fighting. Just take it easy. But that's how I grew up. We're always fighting. We are men. But when you, when you take this, the Bible says he made them male and female. Very simple. But you'd be surprised how many homes have broken down because of not understanding that he made them male and female. It sounds simple, but you have to think about it. It means a lot. It means a, it's a study. It's a study. As a man, you have to learn how to relate with your spouse. Don't take anything for granted. Many men will be surprised how much their wives hot and they never know and 10 years have passed. You'll be surprised what makes a woman hot. And by the way, vice versa, you'll be surprised how much pain just because of expectations. A man should be the greatest cheerleader of his wife. Your hair is nice. You go to the salon, you do a new hair. It looks normal. I mean, when guys cut their hair, whether you like it or not, they like the hair. It's their business. 
If you say you like my hair, good. You don't like my hair, it's your business. I just cut my hair. But a woman takes time to make her hair. And the husband just doesn't notice it. She expects the husband to notice it and, not just, and to compliment it. Nice dress. What about if you don't mean it? Well, just say it. <laughs> How many times do I need somebody to send me a text, I love you, in a day? None. <laughs> Too much wahala. I'm solving problems. I have issues. But you can have a good marriage where the man is not constantly telling the wife how much he loves her. It's just meant to be that way. She needs that. Now, it sounds simple and sounds funny. But for the woman, it doesn't sound funny. The woman is looking for security. The man is looking for significance. Okay? It looks simple. What makes a home work sometimes is so simple that we stumble over it. It's so simple. You, you, you think, what does it require to build a good home? For the Christian, and from a Christian perspective, it's a lot of work. When I say a lot of work, it simply means that if you are going to live in a stress-free environment, you have to love your spouse. But even if you didn't feel like loving, you have to be nice. You have to build on the right foundations. If your marriage is going to go the distance, you have to prepare and equip yourself. Take time to reflect. Ask yourself that if I don't come to maturity at several levels, emotional maturity, intellectual maturity, financial understanding, what do you do when you're not happy, and so on and so forth. What makes dating a problem? Let me go back there for a moment. Do you know how male, males view relationship? Just look at this picture. When a man says, I love a girl, most of the time, it means I want her. No matter where, whether it's said in University of Lagos, said in, in England, doesn't matter. Because he starts from the physical. Physical. How do men evaluate women? Physical. You'll be surprised what they look at. That's the way the brain is configured. Men are visually stimulated. You have to understand that nobody met themselves. The reason that you don't see a lot of naked women, a lot of naked men in magazines is that a naked man, who, is, who cares about a naked man? The, we men, we don't care. You women, do you care? I'm not so sure you do. But just put naked women. You see how many people are, will turn their head, even if they are with their spouse. And some people will have done it before they realize that they did it because of the way the brain is wired for the man. They are visually stimulated. It's very easy for a man to be tempted. A woman's process is a process. Those who are married understand even the more what I'm saying. The man thinks it goes from physical to emotional to the spiritual in the way they talk about relationship. A man sees a woman, he's doing mental evaluation, he's looking from the head to the body. In seconds, it's only a man that will be driving and following a woman from Lagos for Lake to Festac. How do women think? The way women think about relationship is emotions. From emotion to the physical to spiritual oneness, if it's ever attained. But the way God views relationship is that if two people are going to marry and go the distance, they have to start from spiritual connection. Do you have a common destiny? Do you have faith in God? Do I believe in God? God goes from there to emotions, likeness. You know, emotion just means likeness. Just, I, I, I like you, I like you. And then to the physical intimacy. The goal of marriage is to achieve oneness. If you tamper with the process, it's very difficult for the oneness to be achieved. Let me explain. A couple that meets and they start their relation with physical intimacy may be married for 50 years and never achieve oneness. In fact, those are the kind of couples that after 35 years, when the children have grown and gone out, they're divorced. They will have issues. Oneness. What I mean by oneness is a level of connection between two people that you can know what your wife is thinking. You can predict because you've come to know each other. Oneness. I'm not saying 
they are not perfect relationships. Don't misunderstand me. But the point I make is that the Bible says that the two shall become one. That oneness doesn't just mean physical union. It's a level of intimacy that two lives are fused into one. This is God's method. That people meet. They connect spiritually. They walk through the emotions and then get into physical union, which is the climax of marriage. Let's go to Matthew 19, for example. You have to prompt me. I didn't exactly check when I started, so I need to know how many minutes I have so I can know how to connect. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Okay. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished this saying, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, okay? And great multitude followed him, and he healed them there. Then the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any cause? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them what? Male and female. So here is the question. Is it lawful? We've gone through this before. For a man to divorce his wife. He said, didn't you read that they were made male and female? That's a profound statement. In other words, you know, Adam was first created than Eve. So Adam was male and female. That's what he's saying. When Eve was created, God separated the femaleness of man from Adam to create the female. So he said that, don't you know that in the beginning, there was one man who was male and female? Whatever word you want to call it, hermaphrodite in biology, that's not the issue. The important thing is that from God's perspective, they were one. Okay, let's read on. Then he says something. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and, be, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate or put asunder. Verse 7. They said, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. I call it the law of original intent. God had an original plan for marriage. The plan was that people would come together and they don't need to divorce. He said, but why did Moses allow us? He allowed us to write bills of divorce or to divorce our spouses. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, allowed you to divorce your spouses. But he said, but from the beginning, it was never God's plan. Why is that? Because God had an original plan. He wanted loving relationships. Marriage is a touching thing. But it's possible to marry and marry well. Those who will marry well, they have to pay the price. The price is not that so much a struggle. It's that you have to decide to have a home that works. And it starts with the process how you marry. Marry the right way where you count the cost, you accept the responsibility, thank you very much, and you walk through the process. Mentally, you prepare yourself, you, you, you live the selfish life. The more selfish you are, the more presence you're going to have. I'm not talking about oppressing your spouse. I'm talking about a loving relationship. It takes a lot of work. Taking time to understand your spouse, anticipate your spouse, Taking time to live right, talk right, be compassionate, be nice. Don't spend all your energy for those who are single, just saying, I want to marry. Ask those who are married, what can I do differently? How do I prepare myself? How do you know whom to marry? Let me use the last few minutes. Pastor Sonia Delaja tells a story, illustrates the point. He said, when he wanted to marry, he lived in Ukraine for a long time. So it's got used to the white girls, documented his book, and he said he wanted to marry a white girl. It's not verbalized, but he wanted to. In fact, he even told me once over the phone that when Idahosa came, he asked him, what do you think? So that was a deep thought in him. But God gave him a vision as he prayed and prepared for marriage. He said he saw himself trying so many jackets, putting them on. And God would say, too long, too big, too small, too tight. He was wearing different jackets. He wore one. He said, your size. That was written Bosse. And then he knew Bosse, but was not his wife. When the Bible says, I will give him a help mate comparable to That word comparable means his size. 
I'll give you a spouse that's your size. You need to understand this, that if you go to a shoe shop, the same company makes shoes, same leather, same quality, but different sizes. If you buy shoe by cost, say, since they're the same price, I'll pick anyone, you're going to be in trouble. You have to buy your size, though they're the same make. So, all of us here can wear the same shoe from the same company, but different sizes. You can marry anybody, but you can marry oversize. And you can also marry undersize. I can give you examples of oversize. When somebody in a marriage is speaking, somebody say, yeah, just blowing grandma in this house. It's like grandma will go chop oversize. <laughs> when people are intimidated by their spouse, my wife has three master's degrees and is pursuing a PhD. I just have a BSc. There's nothing she will read that matters to me. Because first of all, in my calling, I go deeper and deeper every day. Do you understand what I'm saying? So she, she can't just say, I'm now doctor. By the way, every degree is in my name, you know. So it's not even a problem. Is that not true? So there's no way I'm going to oppress her. I say, you can't, you can't further your education. Who are you? I met men who told me, how can their wife do masters when they've not done masters? Insecurity. Now, if it's financial, there are other reasons. But I'm just trying to say, my wife is my size. She, if she speaks English, I don't understand. I get a dictionary, I check it out. <laughs> Do you understand? I'm not going to be intimidated. The point I'm making is that whether she goes to Harvard, all those things, I know I can relate with her. In fact, it's important that she went to school so we can really relate. You can marry a spouse that is too tight. Now, you know as a pastor, a couple can never stand in front of me and I'll say to them, you're not supposed to be married. I can never say that. I mean, I, I dare not say that. But the reality is that when he says, a spa, it's, I'll give him a help comparable to him. The question is that how would you know who to marry? No formula. Only principles. There's no formula. You don't need to see a vision to marry well. But you need to be guided divinely in marriage. You need to trust God. One of the things you must do when you're single is to learn to hear the voice of God. See, one thing God gave us, Jesus said something. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come. One of the full benefits of the Holy Spirit is not just the fact that I pray in tongues, is that I can be led by God. Very profound. Life has so many decisions that a man that is not divinely guided is going to crash. You know, I've met people who built companies or who were CEO. If I use my brother as an example, when he was CEO at African Capital Alliance, just because he's my sibling and I related with him, believe me, there's no education, education enough to make you build a company. No, no school will teach you all the decision-making processes. Every day, as a leader, you are faced with decisions. If war unto you, if you don't make the right choices. Think about it. People talk about deals, successful deals. The truth is that once misstep, it can crash. The point I'm making is that you have to be guided. What about being a pastor? Marriage. If it's for a long time, it's not what you're seeing today that matters. What about the next 15, 20, 30 years? I have one of our associate pastors in church. This is what I taught them. I just said, when it's time, trust God. Believe God. Pray. God will guide you. He prayed. The first time he said, I found somebody. He just met somebody. He prayed. He said, I believe it's God's will. He said, no problem. I even met the person. Then he came back and said, I had a dream. And the lady left an expensive shoe in my hand and moved away. She went with other people, no problem. And it happened. She moved on. And then the next time, he was not even in church. He just came, collected. He, just, he said, he told me, he said, I prayed. And God said to me, this is a wife. And he said, I only remember the face and the name. And she, he met him in the house, in our house. Because she was, her parents lived in Joss. She went to Barcock University. And the parents brought her to Lagos and said, to my wife and I, look after her and all that. So, he met her in the house, didn't even know much about her. So when he got the number, he called her and said, my name is this. I want you, he did it the old way. He said, I want you to pray about marriage. He said, she was already engaged. And she laughed over the phone. She said, she laughed. I said, this guy. He said, first of all, I thought he was already married. So, But she said, she decided to fast three days. Young girl. On the third day, God gave her his last name, which she didn't know. I said, Nemeka Ikemefula is your husband. And don't laugh over it because it's not just like any other relationship. They are married five years now. That's one way. There are many ways. The important thing is this. 
is that when a marriage starts wrongly, it could potentially end wrongly. There's no formula. Nobody's going to give you a formula. But it's difficult to marry well if you can't discern the voice of God or the will of God. I don't know how God speaks to you, but he has to speak to you somehow for you to survive life. Somehow. You have to make it priority to hear from God. Somebody will say, but pastor, what about people that are not Christian? And so how do they marry? Well, you and I can answer it together, but you are Christian. So you join me, we answer the question, but you can't be asking me because you're Christian, right? You, 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 you get the point. Because I don't know how God speaks to unbelievers, but I know he does guide them. Because he's God over all. But the moment you have his spirit, you can't still be behaving as if you're not without the spirit of God. It's a different ball game. So we can go to India and be asking them, how do you marry? I don't know. But for us in Nigeria, and who are in TPH, it's important to know that it will be, if you start on the wrong note, let, let, let me say this in closing, that potentially people will do the Q&A and whatever, whatever our leaders say. If a marriage is not meant to be, from a divine perspective, and they come together. From a human perspective, nobody can tell you that, right? But even when people have been brought together by God, led, that means with proof, they have enough challenge, believe me. No, ask any married person that is honest. You know, what I mean by challenge is that, it's not like if it's a fight every day. It's just that you realize that marriage is work. You know, you have to be nice, wake up, do things. You have children, you have to look after them. Sometimes they're stressed, you have to manage the stress. You have to, when you talk wrongly, you say, I'm sorry for talking wrongly. It's, then imagine it was not meant to be. It means that what your spouse would have loved about you, this person just, just cannot stand. Final point. You should never marry a person to do them a favor. It's for a lifetime. Don't say, ah, if I walk away, I'm going to break his heart or her. Break the heart. <laughs> a broken relationship, broken courtship is better than a broken marriage. The damages of a broken marriage. We are pastors. We work with people. When a marriage is not working well, the consequences are so much. You are helpless as a leader. If people come here and they tell you stories, you can only pray. You can't guarantee that the prayer will be answered this way or that way. When it's not working, it's so miserable. The closest thing to hell on earth is a marriage that didn't work. And the closest thing to heaven on earth is a marriage where the partners understand each other and they're doing well together. It looks like heaven. You just have a friend, you're so close, you're naked before each other. So it's not something to be taken casual. And in marriage, they say a holy estate until death do us part. That's the Christian way. And I believe the Christian way is the best way. Don't enter marriage with the option that I can walk away because you will walk away if you do. Let's pause here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm free. He said I can call for questions. So if you have any question, he has the mic. Just signify by maybe a show of your hand. We'll come to you. We'll take as many as we can um, in the limited time that we have. Just questions. Um, you want to write it down? If you're more comfortable with that, would, not a problem. If you want to speak out, we're not all bold, but hey. If it's too complex, I'll pass it on to the pastors. Don't worry about it. We can form a committee to answer it. It's not a problem. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Hello? Okay. You're on. Oh, yeah. Um, I know uh, you, you talked about the uh, spiritual aspect of praying and seeking God. Yes. But on the practical level, yes. you have to get to know the person. Do what? You have to get to know the person. Okay. So um, my question is, can a person, a man really love a woman and be, and be stingy? Can, can that kind of relationship work when a man is being stingy and, you know, I don't know, can a woman go ahead and marry a stingy man? That's the question. <laughs> I'm glad you're all laughing. Can a woman 
go ahead and love and marry a stingy man. I don't know how we can define stinginess. But, let's, but think about it like this. The first point to make is that if you're about to marry a man that is stingy, it means you have married a stingy man. That means you're going to have a lot of stinginess in the marriage. So one of the things to remember about marriage is that marriage doesn't change people. And you can never change your spouse because changing you is so difficult. So adults rarely change. It's a miracle when an adult changes. I mean, when I mean change, I mean change. Sometimes people change. Culture, office, corporate culture, all those kind of things. But change is not that simple. So what you see is what you get. Right? Now, when you use, say stingy, that's why I said working on yourself. The thing about marriage is that if a man is not able to give freely to his wife, they will have conflict. Maybe if you are stingy, be stingy to yourself and prepare yourself that you are going to part with things you don't want to part in marriage. Because when you are getting married, the, the pastors that marry, the priests, they will tell you from this point onwards, your body is not your own. Everything you have is not your own. That's the practice of marriage. In, but in reality, people don't practice that. People still say, my car, my house. In fact, in the world today, people prepare for divorce by saying, which, which ones? I mean, they have names for all those things. Nupita, all those, I don't know. I mean, all kinds of names. I mean, something like Donald Trump. I'm sure that the present wife has access to nothing. <laughs> yes, because he, I'm sure he's making sure he didn't marry her. She didn't marry him for his money. I mean, it's for me, I learned some of those words. Because he's been married three times. The point I'm making again is that when you say stingy, if a man is stingy before marriage, he's going to remain stingy after marriage. The question is that what will be the impact of stinginess on marriage? Stress, conflict. So what is my counsel? Not much counsel. <laughs> the truth is that marriage requires you to give. I don't know how to say that. The way I perceive marriage is that there's nothing I have that my wife wants I can't give her. The reason is that that's the only way it works, to the best of my knowledge. You know what I mean? Um, so if you're a man here and you're stingy and you want to marry, just take counsel, really, that if you don't give freely, depending on the contest, you, it will lead to stress, questions, but you know something about marriage is that every question you're going to ask has a context. And, all, and the answers we give are as partial as the context is partial. That's what I would say. But if there's somebody there, somebody stingy, should they marry them? I don't know how to answer that question, no. <laughs> Let's take the next one. It's true. If I tell you a story, you know, my immediate elder brother said when he was getting married, he was shopping in London with the wife-to-be. And he said, he was trying to act the way, I guess, a man should act, like holding back. He said, look, this is marriage. It's not a joke. <laughs> he said, before he knew, he parted with money that ordinarily he wouldn't part with. I'm sure since then, he must be parting with money. Because I'm not sure a marriage can survive if you don't part with something. I'm not sure. Well, go ahead. Yes. Is it right for you to get married to a Muslim? Is it right for a Christian to get married to a Muslim? Well, according to the Bible, you should not be unequally yoked. The reason is that a Christian marrying a Christian has enough problem. You don't need a Muslim. You are not supposed to. Because you can't save another person. If you marry a Muslim, you are not of the same faith. How do you like it when it's time to pray? Your wife says, pray your own. I pray my own. That's a recipe for trouble. There's enough challenge between two Christians getting married. So even human logic will, not, will, not, will teach you otherwise. And God in particular doesn't want that. It's because of that question you asked that God made Abraham to send his servant to go back to his family to find a wife. But what if she's ready to change? That's a very complex question. When you say, let me say something. People seldom change. I thank God for the power of God, but never enter into marriage hoping, building it on the fact that a partner will change. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Change is such a process that by the time they are changed, you might not be in the marriage yourself. 
It's such a process. Okay. Any question? This side. It's either we have a perfect class, or people are shy, or the or is it anybody? Okay, his hand is up. If you don't have, I, I too will ask you before we close. Eh? I'll throw here. Okay. Yeah, his hand is up. Yeah. I know it's Thank you topic. very much, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Um, you, did, you did give a lot of concept which really mattered. I, I, I will give an example of it. Yes, sir. It took me forever to get married. Wow. Because I know, because when I was looking for a best man, all my friends were married. I couldn't even get the best man. I eventually took a friend that has three kids. The kids were running after him in the church. Um, <laughs> there was one particular thing you mentioned, and that I took upon myself. I literally flip up easily when things don't work my way. And I thought I was going to get married. How will a wife live with me when I'm exhibiting this sense of anger? Honestly, honestly, I'll say this today. I took time to pray and made a vow to myself, I need to stop anger. First of all, first of all, because I will not want my wife or my children to see me exhibiting anger in that way. Um, let me be honest with you, that worked for a very long time. When you are broke, anger flips in. <laughs> I don't know if it happens to all men. Not because you want to be angry, anger just radiates. Because things are not working. We may understand what they say. But the good side around it is when that they say, My wife to has a chicken. way of. Every time she sees me trying to do something, she probably asks, Do you want me to transfer some money? I don't know how she understood that, which is what you mentioned about anticipating me. And honestly, it has worked. I have a question, though. Yes, sir. How do women who always think they would change a man? I've seen that so many times. Yes. Don't worry, he will change for me. Mm -hmm. He will change for me. Yes. How do you advise them now? That, that's the that, that, that I may not me. change for you. Okay. It, it very, we have to clap for him. We have to clap for him. You know, they told the story of um, Gandhi. I think it was sugar that he was using a lot of it. I'm not sure. And the woman, was it sugar? Yeah, a woman came to him and complained about the son. Yeah, so he didn't say a word. Then after, I think, about three months, he come back in eight weeks. So when they came back, he took those eight weeks to reduce his own intake of sugar, to have the moral basis to advise the woman about the son. Does that make sense? He didn't feel that he was in a moral position to be talking about a person's problem when he had the same problem. That's leadership, right? So... I, my brother blessed me by saying that he had a trait which he felt could be injurious to marriage, to his home, you know, outbursts or being angry, you know, and he worked on it. I'm sure that he'll find out that he's going to work on it for the rest of his life. But, it, but that sense of responsibility makes it much easier if you say, you know what, I, I, this is right, but the way I've done it is not right. And to respond to the question, I think that more likely than not, it, might, it could be women that will take that step more who think I can change my man for one reason or that I feel maybe I'm growing older or I, I really like this guy. Let's be upfront. You can't change anybody. It doesn't sound so nice, but what you see is what you get. People can transform, don't misunderstand me, but it's such a, it's a partnership between them and their maker that you don't really have much role. You can only pray for them, but you can't say you must change. Look, this thing must, it won't happen. In fact, the person will get more angry with you. So if you are in a relationship and you feel that I don't like what I'm seeing, so that, she asked the question, and I want to bring it all together to say that if God leads us in relationships, since we are not perfect, he's going to still lead us to an imperfect vessel. The difference between divine guidance to say that I know that this is my wife is that the conviction makes it easier to stay in the relationship. If you knew that God 
brought you into a relationship, even if it's not working, that conviction is a strong basis to say, but this is my wife from God. If you're not sure, you can be going back and forth. So if you pray and God were to guide you, however it is, I don't want to make it so spiritual, whether it's just intuition, reading the word, whether it's even likeness or you found yourself in the same place at the same time, that God that brought you that far is the God you need to talk to about your spouse. You don't need to hound it over your spouse and be telling them their faults because since you have your own fault. You don't focus on your partner in marriage. It's a recipe for failure. Telling people what they're doing wrong, what, what's not working, the thing that is wrong with them. The average adult gets angry when they do that. You just can't do that. You just have to focus on yourself. And the easiest way to help people change, by the way, is to change yourself. You know, Dr. Nozo tells a story, and I, I hope I get it right, you know. He says when they got married, I don't know at what point, that he'll come home and the wife, Auntie Miriam, will leave the AC on, you know. But he was wise enough to know that there's no way to tell your spouse to turn off the AC, that it won't cause trouble. There's no way. Try it all the ways, you know. It's like, you know, think about it. There's, even if you lower your voice, this AC... So the best thing is to just put it off yourself. Because the stress that will come from that statement, you'll be surprised. So he was wise. He said he did it, he did it, put it off for like three, four years before the wife came to. Just basically, and I, I met a husband that said, either a wife, the wife said the husband grew up in a home where they didn't close the door. Just walks into a room, leaves the door open. And the way she grew up, they not only closed the door, gently. So you can imagine how irritable your husband will just walk into the room, careless, like just leave the door. She would just go back and close it. But she was wise enough not to tell the husband, close this door now because that can make it set the house on fire. <laughs> this marriage will have, you'll be surprised how your partner will be pressing this. You know, you may grow up in a proper home where you press um, the, the, what do you call it, toothpaste tube. You just press from under, be going. Some people just come, just press it. <laughs> Look, people fight over that. It's like, ah, didn't they bring your property? Are you, you're cursing my father? <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is that these things will happen. You'll find your spouse cooking rice the way you don't think rice can be cooked. If you don't have self-control, you say, look, what, what is this? Is this rice? <laughs> so, I think that you can't change anybody. Marriage is the best school for maturity and leadership. If you can marry well, you can lead a nation. In fact, in colonial America, the reason that divorced people were not allowed to lead as president is that keeping a home, both in the church and in society, is actually proof of growing leadership. Because if you can keep your home, that same process of keeping your wife or your children or working together to make your home work, it takes a lot from you. It makes you a better leader. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more. Last one. Um, my no, question, he's going to. My question has is a lot. in relation to courtship. To what extent would you advise um, in the courting process actually embarking on personal investigation? So personal if, you, investigation. If, you, if you prayed, the person has prayed and they said, you know, they think you're their husband or their wife and you want to kind of go back to some of the olden days ways of actually asking people for, I don't know what you call it, character recommendations mm -hmm. without potentially jeopardizing the trust issues. Would you, how would you recommend going about such, a, particularly if the person you say is not in your social network? Mm -hmm. As we know, our society is, a lot of people know each other, but sometimes you meet people who no one seems to know this person. So you want to sort of dig a bit deeper. Would you advise that as a strategy perhaps to, to embark on? Very good question, very important question. I'll tell you a story. I know somebody that was getting married. She, she was married and marriage dissolved. You know, um, I think, you know, she went through a process. She's Christian. Met a man in the course of her life who was interested in her, wanted to marry her. And they were going to be joined by a church. But the church, and the man also had been married. The church insisted that both of them must bring proof of divorce basically this is not too long ago the woman was able to bring her the man kept telling stories eventually i think the woman she in question traveled to the uk where he was living and went to 
you know, or to call somebody up and they went to the courts and there was no proof that he was divorced. In fact, he was, really, he was still married over there. Cards had been printed. I, it was on the wedding day. I went to the wedding venue and her brother told me that the wedding had been called off. I went to the wedding venue just to say to them, I'll be late, but I'll be at the reception. And I just saw him. So there's a place for references and all that. But how do you bring the balance here? There's a difference, you know, when you say character reference now, if I, I'm a Christian, I become a Christian, and then, you know, because I must have had a past and I lived my life and I gave my life to Christ, whether as a teenager or older, you know, and somebody, maybe the woman feels led to the man or whichever way, and they come to an agreement, it depends on what you're referencing. Um, is it that I remember trying to employ a girl in church some two, three years ago. When they went to ask questions from her neighbors, they all said, ah, this girl, she follows men, no. I told them, that's why I want to employ her, so that she'll stop following men. And to be honest with you, she started working with us in church. I don't know what she was, but the person that works with us is a growing Christian. So the question is that, what's the boundary? What are you investigating? People have asked me the question of disclosure. How, sh how much should people disclose about their past when they're getting married? And I said, you know, if you're a Christian, you have conviction about somebody. Conviction. What I'm by conviction is that just assume, it's an assumption, that God leads me to say that this is your wife. God. It depends on what you mean by that. There's a place for investigation, but... In Ukraine, where I went, where former prostitutes had become apostles in the ministry. And they, they said, if you have been a former prostitute, stand up. Over 200 people are standing on the stage, and they are all married. And they were prostitutes. What, so I don't understand. Do you, do you get the point I'm making? The point I'm trying to make is that if there's nobody without a past, but if somebody is still in their past, that means somebody is a liar. Not that he used to be a liar. That's a different ballgame. But if you say, oh, that I heard that you used to lie, he said, but I'm a Christian. I'm even an usher in church. I've not lied in the last five years. I've been saved for five years. He said, but, but I met somebody. was your classmate. He said, in primary school, you lie so much. That's why I say, what's the boundary? So the church has a role to play, but, but understand that, that everybody's coming from somewhere. So be careful what you're investigating. If somebody is genuinely saved, has testimony in church with Character reference in the local church. That's why the local church is important. They say, but we heard that he stole five years ago. It depends on whether he's still a thief or whether he used to be a thief. That's how I put it. Does that make sense? Yeah, because if you, if, because, you, know, if you start investigating all of us here, nobody will go to preach today. Oh. <laughs> I hope you know. Nobody's going to preach. I mean, think about it. Pastor Tony will not preach. Will you preach? <laughs> I will not preach. You, yes, it's the truth. The Bible says, Paul said, I was the chiefest of sinners. But God in his mercy through grace, what? Save me. That's what I'll say. Thank you very much. Welcome to this.